Good evening and welcome to this movie on do-it-yourself automatic gearbox basics. Uh, the idea behind this movie is uh, you're a guy like me, you've got a, uh, a classic car or a young classic from the uh, 80s, 90s or zeros. You've got an auto box, you want to overhaul the auto box or uh, you want to somehow modify the auto box. In this movie I'm going to explain you uh, the basics of an automatic transmission. Uh, clutch packs, clutch plates, uh, planetary gear set, brake bands uh, and what you can and cannot do on your gearbox. Right here you see a plastic bin. In this plastic bin you see part of a transmission drive line. The other part is over here in the second bin. Uh, the bell housing is, uh, is somewhere else. I'm not going to show the bell housing in this movie. This is a 5 HP 18 gearbox from a BMW. In my channel you can also find a movie where I actually the, uh, disassemble this gearbox. But for now I only need uh, the items that you see right here to explain you the basics. The general idea is that you have a gasoline engine. That gasoline engine has a certain torque curve and at a certain engine RPM it delivers maximum torque. Preferably you want to keep the engine on that maximum torque point or around your maximum torque RPM to get the most benefit from your, your engine. The best fuel economy is usually also found around your uh, max torque RPM but this can differ from engine to engine. It is not possible to keep your engine on that max torque uh, on that certain max torque RPM because you need to shift into another gear else you would accelerate to a certain gear with only one gear in your car have your RPM on that uh, torque level and you would never be able to go any faster because you wouldn't be in your torque uh, uh, area anymore your power band so we invented the transmission using multiple gears uh, you can uh, shift up on a higher gear put your car in your power band again and start putting power on your drive line again and going faster the manual gearbox is pretty simple, it's a set of gears on shafts and you are manually controlling which gears you are combining, meaning that you are controlling the way you put your engine torque on the road. The automatic gearbox however is a bit different. Let's first take a look at the gear set that we are using in an automatic transmission. I'm just going to put this thrust bearing away. Right here you see a planetary uh, gear set from this gearbox, you see a sun gear, there's planet gears in inside here, there's a ring gear around here. I recommend you just google planetary gear set uh, GIF so you see a moving image and you'll understand exactly what this is about. Depending on using the sun gear or the planets or uh, the ring gear that we, we have around or blocking either one of them compared to the other, we are getting a certain flow of torque through the gear set meaning that we are increasing RPM on the other side but lowering torque or we are decreasing our input to output RPM and that means we are increasing torque. When you are accelerating from, uh, from zero, basically what you are doing is you are increasing the torque at the output shaft of the gearbox, but in, in doing that you are decreasing the speed of the output shaft, meaning that you'll accelerate quite quick with that high torque, but you'll never get very far and you need to shift up. In the overdrive gear we are doing exactly everything the way around. We are increasing the RPM at the output shaft, but we are decreasing the, uh, the engine torque that we have on the input shaft, so the outgoing torque is lower. This is why you cannot really accelerate from, a, from an overdrive gear, because your car doesn't have enough torque on that output shaft. The entire actuation of gears is done by yourself, by your foot and your hand, when you're dealing with a manual transmission. When you are dealing with an automatic transmission, in, like this example, you actually need something or somebody to do the work for you. In this case it's the valve body, the valve body will be explained in a different story, but the basic idea is that the valve body actuates clutches in drums and depending on which clutch you have activated or deactivated, you have that certain flow of torque through your gear set. So right here you see one of those clutch packs, it's simple uh, friction material with steel material in between. Uh, below this drum is another clutch pack, and around this clutch pack will go that brake band. More about that brake band later. And the basic idea is on the bottom of this drum we have a piston. Fluid pressure with automatic transmission fluid is being supplied to the piston. The piston moves outward and in doing so it presses this clutch pack against this snap ring, this end ring that you see here. The clutch pack cannot escape from the drum because the ring holds it in place. And if this clutch, clutch pack is engaged you are coupling this drum to whatever you put inside this drum and the teeth make sure that you are taking the inner part with you. Depending on the clutches you have active or inactive you have that certain gear. 
We're going to take uh, this one apart. I'm going to move the drum from the support that you see here. And here you see another clutch pack. The brake band that you see here is an alternative to clutches. Brake bands were, you, were, were very common in the 60s, 70s, 80s and were kind of on their way out in the 90s, being replaced by transmissions, transmissions with only clutches. The brake band goes around the drum exactly in this order. One side of the brake band is fixed on a pin, the other side is on a movable pin. And whenever I don't want this drum to spin, the only thing I do is actuate the pin and the brake band will hold this drum in place making sure that this drum cannot move. Now let's disassemble one of these clutches and take a look at what we got. To disassemble that clutch, you find the snap ring. There is always an opening somewhere uh, on the snap ring. In this case, the opening of my snap ring sits right here. And we are going to pry out that snap ring and take a look at the clutch back. Using that thin screwdriver, I want to try to get behind the snap ring. I may need an even thinner screwdriver. And with the screwdriver behind the snap ring, I'm able to wiggle it out. Then with my hands, I can take out the snap ring. And now it's interesting to take a look at what we have here. We first have a very thick steel end plate. More about that plate in a minute. Then we have a friction plate two-sided friction material. There is also brands who have friction on one side then steel on the other side and in that case you only have one type of plate in your pack. Now we have a thin steel plate followed by another friction plate followed by another thin steel plate and another friction plate followed by another thin steel plate and that's the bottom of the clutch pack. Right here you see the piston right here you see a spring this spring now has uh, a tiny little bit of tension with, these, uh, uh, with the caps that you see right here and here. Um, the moment the piston is actuated by fluid pressure, it's pushing, pushing in against this spring. So it needs a certain pressure to be able to defeat the counter pressure it gets from the spring. Whenever we want this clutch to disengage, the only thing we have to do is make sure the piston no longer gets fluid pressure and then this spring will automatically put the, uh, uh, the piston back in place making sure that the clutch pack disengages. This is the trick behind actuating the different clutches. Back to the clutch pack itself. Sometimes instead of a thin steel plate at the beginning, you will find a waved very thin steel plate at the beginning. This is normal. The waved steel plate which goes right in front of the first thin steel plate is actually meant to make sure that the uh, the piston doesn't immediately grab the clutch, it'll, it'll cause kind of a little bit of a delay and a gradual application of the clutch. The thin steel plates and the friction discs are actually your clutch pack. Now you're wondering why do I have a thick steel plate on the end? That's, uh, that's a very simple uh, answer. The moment you uh, would not have the thick but another thin steel plate on the end, so let's assume the clutch pack would be uh, mounted in this way, there would be a thin steel plate here and there's a thin steel plate right there. You are pushing that clutch pack against this snap ring in that drum, but what would happen because of the high pressure on that thin steel plate is that the thin steel plate would start to bulge out and possibly would break because of fatigue. So the final steel plate in your clutch pack always needs to be thick enough to be able to withstand the total pressure it's getting against the snap ring in the groove. A little info on the side. Let's assume you have a certain transmission uh, on a certain application and you want to upgrade your automatic transmission. You want your automatic transmission to be able to handle more torque. There's a few tricks to upgrade an automatic transmission. First, you need to make sure that the rotational torque that you are putting on the different metal parts won't actually break the metal parts. That's a calculation or an estimation or just uh, hoping that it won't break. Let's assume that your rotational torque won't screw up your metal parts and you're dealing with clutch pack problems and you want to upgrade the clutch packs. There's multiple ways you can go. Let's have a look. We have a clutch plate, we have a clutch set here with uh, three friction discs and four steel discs. We have uh, the steel disc on the beginning, steel disc on the end and in between we have three friction discs. We want to upgrade this clutch pack. Let's assume we have enough space in the drum to add another friction disc and to add another steel plate. That means the clutch pack can evenly handle more load. So if these three clutch packs together 
would be able to handle 150 Nm. A fourth clutch, pack, a fourth clutch plate with steel plate would make us go up to 200 Nm. There's also an alternative. In this case, we cannot upgrade the clutch because as I start assembling the clutch again, you will note that entering that, uh, putting that final thick steel plate in the drum, I am already closing in on my snap ring groove right here. The snap ring groove sits right there. I just put my flathead screwdriver in the groove. So that means I simply don't have room to add more friction and steel material. If I would increase the pressure that the valve body puts on this piston, I would also increase the torque handling capacity. For example, if my torque handling capacity is 300 Nm and I increase my pressure by 10%, my torque capacity also roughly increases with that 10%. But the problem with increasing the pressure is, this piston will push on this clutch pack much harder, the snap ring will probably take it, but you are not sure if the little teeth that you have here, which is only a thin part of the total area, can handle that pressure, that force. If it cannot handle the force you are putting on that piston, you will actually break these teeth and the snap ring and the clutch set will just come out, rendering this drum and this clutch useless, meaning you lose gear. So, whenever you are upgrading a transmission, you always need to make sure you can actually uh, you can actually put your upgrades into place. There is also an alternative, which the is theoretically possible. We don't have room for extra material, but what we could do is remove some material from the steel, and if it's a little bit thinner, it can probably still hold. Remove some material per uh, a steel plate, assuming you have the right tools to shave off, uh, let's say, 20% uh, per steel plate. And some uh, percentage right here, 3 times 20% is 60, 40 and, and then another 20% here, which is roughly the same. I could add another friction plate and another steel plate. Theoretically, this is possible, and you may look out that the thinner, but still thicker, uh, end plate can hold the clutch. Um, risk here is, as the clutch disengages and engages, there's going to be a lot of heat around those friction discs, and the steels are used to transfer that heat into your ATF fluid. If your steels are thinner, they heat up more quickly, and automatic transmissions don't like heat. Enemy number one, aside from design flaws on automatic transmissions, is not necessarily a high load, but high heat. So, thinning out those steel plates is absolutely no option, as the heat handling capacity of your clutch drops. Another thing to take into account on uh, clutch uh, pack technology, basically, is um, if for whatever reason you have steels of different dimensions, if for whatever reason you are stacking uh, a clutch pack in a high drum on a heavy duty transmission, you want the thickest steels of the pack, not the end plate, let's disregard the end plate for now, you want the thickest steels that you have in your pack to be on the middle of the total uh, clutch pack. So this is a pack made of three steels, so this is the middle steel. I want this middle steel to be the thickest of them all uh, if I have a choice. Reason for that is, most heat is generated in the middle of the clutch pack. So with different dimensions, you want the best, the thickest steels to be in the middle. We're going to put this snap ring together. We'll pretend we just overhauled this clutch with, uh, with new frictions. Often you can just put it in by hand, assisted with a little small screwdriver. If you're working on an aluminum drum, this is a steel drum, just be careful because you can easily damage the soft aluminum. And now we've got our clutch assembled again. And remember, we're pretending that we replaced the O-rings and we're pretending that we have new frictions. There's something called end play or end clearance that you need to check. The valve body and the electronics of the transmission or the hydraulic circuit is designed in such a way that the distance between the clutch uh, without being actuated towards the snap ring is between a certain minimum and maximum value. So what you want to do when you're using backyard tools and you don't have any fancy, transmi fancy transmission tools, you want to put your fingers on the steel, you want to push the steel plate down, you then want to put the snap ring all the way up, and with your screwdriver like this be between the steel and the snap ring, you take feeler gauges, let's pretend I've got uh, a feeler gauge right here, and you're going to make sure you correctly measure this distance with your feeler gauge. And this distance needs to be between a certain value. I'm going to put uh, the standard industry standard uh, value of end clearance right here in the movie.
A transmission overall in general, let's be honest, that's actually what we're here for, involves fitting new clutches, new steel discs if your discs are in bad shape, and replacing any compromised piston or compromised hard part, a bearing, uh, a drum, a piston, any of these, uh, any of these uh, caps, the spring, or uh, a truss bearing like here. Basically, on this specific transmission, there are no real uh, major issues, except for uh, the drum that's over there, so it's recommended to always replace that certain drum. Uh, but you also want to push out these pistons with compressed air, so you can actually uh, repair the seals on those pistons. Uh, the seals may still be intact, this uh, transmission is uh, a few years old, I've replaced all the seals. They're probably still intact and good to go for another 10 years, but let's assume that your transmission did 25 years, or uh, 300,000 miles something, the O-ring on the outside and the inside of the piston will need replacement. Uh, it's also possible that you want to um, fit a new bushing in the middle of this drum, drum which is uh, a sleeve bearing, as it can wear out. These are all the different aspects that come into play when you're dealing with a transmission you want to overhaul. Uh, a general, let's say, tier 1 transmission overall involves uh, a valve body checkup, oil filter, uh, new clutch plates, uh, possibly new steel plates and any other uh, visibly uh, compromised part. Uh, tier 2 repair would be that you uh, push out all the pistons and you remove and replace all the o-rings and when you do a real let's say tier 3 high level uh, repair you are uh, you are thinking of replacing all the bearings even bearings that are still in good shape uh, and any drum with any kind of visual damage. I would recommend you do a tier 2 repair. I would recommend if you work on a transmission you always take all the pistons out, you always replace all the o-rings. If you have vulcanized or molded rubber pistons, always replace uh, pistons with vulcanized or rubber ends as they can come off uh, when, they, when, they, uh, when those transmissions get old. Uh, and don't go uh, cheap on the money. Reason for this is very simple. Uh, getting a transmission from a car is never really an easy process. Removing a spark plug from a car is done in uh, let's say maximum 15 minutes if you have a nasty car. But removing a transmission, at least half a day of work. You don't want to remove that transmission again within one or two years after you've done your overhaul. This is basically uh, the end of the movie about uh, basic transmission theory, how this works, clutches and bands, um, upgrading the transmission uh, about the clutches and the drums only if possible. I uh, hope you like this movie, I hope it helps you in, in your uh, project of getting your transmission out and uh, repairing your transmission. If you have any questions, just ask them. If you like my movies and you want to support me, just subscribe to my channel. I'll see you gentlemen in the next movie.